É, que é o mais gostado. Ok, ups. Ok, so here we are again on day three for the afternoon session with Ajahn Brahm. And this is the Sutta class from the Word of the Buddha. And I think yesterday we got onto the Satipatthanas, although just the preamble took quite a while. So for this session, as usual, we'll have about 40 minutes maybe of the Sutta class, then a five minute break, yeah, and some questions, because I would imagine that more questions might be formulating in people's minds. So as you like, Ajahn, please begin. Oh, as I like. As you okay. like. So we'll now uh, finish off the session <laughs> and we'll go to <laughs> No, it's okay, let's do the Sutta class. So this is again from the Word of the Buddha translation, which I did. And this is to the right mindfulness and uh, the preamble, which is really important, the four focuses of mindfulness is always having restrained the five hindrances. It doesn't mean having abandoned them yet, but having weakened them so much, you're able to do these uh, awareness of the body, experience, mind, and mind objects, or dhammas. And yesterday I did mention about the first of these, the mindfulness of the body, which is you know, of uh, your body, how it is, how it works. And we started off with the mindfulness of breathing, which is so common, as many times how people practice. And I did make the point, you go to a quiet, secluded place, sit down comfortably and give priority, parimukhan, to establishing mindfulness. And then mindful, you breathe in, mindful, you breathe out. But once you have that mindfulness there, you breathe in and breathe out. You don't have to do this to breathe in and to breathe out. It actually happens all by itself, breathing. Your job is just to observe it, just like you're being a supervisor. You're not actually doing anything. You're just watching and observing. And when the in-breath and out-breath are long, you're aware that they are long. When the in-breath and out-breath are short, you're aware that they are short. Now, even those first two stages, which are common uh, for you, they happen just after uh, you, you know, of, of breathing in and breathing out, you're mindful of breathing in and breathing out. And then you just notice some of their details. What's a long breath? What's a short breath? Now, first of all, when I started to do this, it was a type of meditation, it was okay, but they were made a point of doing a, a long breath, first of all, then a short breath, then a medium breath. I forget exactly all the little stages, but all that really did was to make you interested in the breath. The psychology of human beings you know, in places like Europe and England is they always want to measure where they're at. How do you get to the next stage? What do I do next? And so by saying you do a very long breath and then a medium breath and then a lesser medium breath and a short breath and you go to some other breath, it gives people an interest in watching the breath. And the trouble is that sometimes you say here, you watch the in-breath and out-breath along, you're aware that they are long. Sometimes we people think, well, Ajahn Brahm, please explain, how long is long? I mean, how long do you have to make it? Because sometimes my breath, they say, it's not long, it's not short, it's kind of in between. Are we not practicing breathing meditation? It's not long, it's not short, it's somewhere in the middle, and that's not included in here. What it says, you know, the long breath, the short breath, not the medium breath. And of course, the misunderstanding, the purpose of this, it just makes the breath more interesting to watch. Gives you a little bit more to observe with your breathing. And because of that, in other traditions, they, instead of actually doing a long breath, a short breath, sometimes you just give the breath um, like a mantra, like a word you say with the breath going in and going out. In the Thai forest tradition, they always used to use a buddho mantra. Breathing in, bud, breathing out, ho, oh, bud, ho, bud, ho, bud, ho. And you know, that was quite effective, especially for people who were, you know, uh, there were been Buddhists for generations, and the word Buddha had a huge meaning for them. But when I started teaching that over here in uh, the West, 
it didn't really work so well for them because the Buddha didn't have that same uh, power to their consciousness as a, you know, as a, say, a Thai or a Sri Lankan was born with that word and saw that word all over the place or in Burma. So instead, <coughs> I tried all sorts of other mantras. You know, say one idea breathing in, one idea when you're breathing out. One of the ones I tried because I thought this was going to be really fantastic for Westerners was as you're breathing in to actually to, to chant the word to yourself, shut. And as you breathe in, up. Breathing in, shut. Breathing out, up. Shut. Up. In other words, stop talking to yourself and thinking. But of course, people just thought that was funny. They didn't take it seriously. So I tried these other mantras. And in the end, the one which I really stuck with as a teaching, I don't use it. I, honestly, I don't use it for myself because you don't really need it. It's very easy for me to get interested in the breath. I've been watching it for years. So instead, they would ask people to breathing in, uh, breathing in peace or breathing in health or breathing in contentment. Whatever positive thing it is you want to breathe in as you're meditating. And as you breathe out, breathe out, let go. And let go of uh, sickness, let go of tension, let go of pain, whatever it is. And you imagine that. You imagine just as you're breathing in, you know, what peace means to you, whether you can visualize it as like a white dove or something what a health means to you, whatever kindness means to you. Imagine it, don't just say the word because words in themselves haven't got much power, but if you give them a meaning and paint the picture, what peace means to you, and that's you know, how you feel it. And then you breathe in peace. This beautiful sense that nothing is moving, no words, no disturbance. You just imagine that and breathe it in with your breath as if peace is just coming into your body. Or, you know, if you're sick with some illness like a cancer and you breathe in health, you know what health means, how it feels. And imagine just breathing that in with every in breath. And with the letting go with the out breath, you breathe out something which is a problem for you, a difficulty for you, a worry for you. You imagine it, I sometimes, when I was experimenting with this years ago, you imagine it like it was a bird going out, but it was carrying with it sort of all the negativity or difficulties you had that went out on the back of this bird. So little by little, breathing in peace, breathing out uh, stress. You make up your own words in your own language, but keep it simple. And then you find it's, it actually works for you. It brings greater health, greater peace, greater success. And sort of, uh, it's a great way of letting things go. But it's not just for that. That's, it's almost like a, a byproduct. The real meaning is that you become interested in your breath. It makes it more important for you to keep with it. It's not so boring. And other times people do counting with the breathing. So breathing in one, breathing out. One, breathing in, two, breathing out, two, <coughs> in, three, out, three. But of course, that, that depends on just, uh, you know, how you like numbers. And some people said, that was very good, breathing in one, but then what do you do? You just keep counting, counting, counting. Breathing in, 72, breathing out, 72, breathing in. So usually I kept it to nine. Breathing in one, breathing out one, in two, out two, up to nine. And then I start again, breathing in one, out one, and up to eight next time. Breathing in one, out one, in two, out two, up to seven. Breathing in one, out one, in two, out two, up to six. Breathing in one, out one, up to five. Breathing in one, out one, in two, out two, in three, out three, in four, out four. In one, out one, in one, out two, in one, out three, in three, out three. And from one to two, and then just breathing in, breathing out. And people like that because it did give them something of interest to watch a breath with. And that, that was actually 45 breaths you had to watch to be able to keep, keep one cycle going. 
But you know, that was an early part of my time training like that. And then once you did one cycle, you did another cycle and another cycle. But you had to be very honest with yourself because you know, sometimes instead of say breathing in one, out to up to nine and then going one to eight, sometimes you can't just find yourself breathing in 15, out 15, in 16, out 16, you've forgotten. You have worked mindfully enough. It was a good way of seeing with you really clear. Well, after all, it came a bit tiring to me, so I didn't really need to do that. So you just uh, breathe in and breathe out. You just knew it was long or shorter in between. You didn't worry which one it was. You just enjoyed it. Just made the breath a tiny bit more interesting. And the next thing we see here is then you learn to experience the whole of the breath as you breathe in and out. And sometimes I just really wonder, you know, some of the scholars, whether they really know what they're talking about, whether they've ever done any breath meditation before. Because sometimes the word is, you know, is the, the body of the breath, the whole of the breath as you breathe in and out. But even the Buddha said, you know, the breath is a body amongst bodies. And the word body, kaya, in Pali, it does mean just a group of things. It doesn't always mean just the physical body of a human being. It's very similar to the, word, the use of the word body in English. They have a body of evidence, a body of truth. And even in, uh, in Pali, they have you know, the body of Dhamma, the body of Vinaya. It doesn't mean a physical body, it means just an accumulation of things. And it's very clear that that third a landmark, I won't call it a stage of meditation, the landmark of, of this mindfulness of breathing practice is you see the whole of the breath as it comes in and it goes out. I'm just going to give a little demonstration here. You can actually see my finger. Now this is breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. So that's actually the first couple of stages with a long breath or a short breath. But then the third stage is to see from the very beginning of an in-breath, you see every stage of the finger moving across the screen, every part of it. You even see when that breath finishes. You see in-breath is finished and there's a pause. You see that and then you see the out-breath start to happen and then come to its end, and there's another pause. You don't miss a moment of the passage of the breath. And that is how I explain. <coughs> you will notice the whole of the breath. It's the third stage of the meditation. It's not the body, because the body, the purpose of this part of meditation is actually to be able to just to isolate just the breath, so the rest of the body just falls off the screen. You're zooming in on the breath. So other parts of the body vanish. I always found that very, very, very useful. And I did mention a few occasions that you could, so I overcame the disturbance of mosquitoes biting you. There were very, very uh, many of them in, when you meditate in the jungles. And not only many of them, but they would be on your skin, irritating you all the time. So how could you get some peace from that? And of course, I just started washing the breast. And just you zoomed in on it. It was pleasant, so I could do it pretty easily. Zoom in on the breath. Just like you zoom in on, say, Google Maps or something. As you zoom in, you find out what was on the edge of the screen just falls off the screen. And that's what was happening with meditating just on the breath, zoom in on it, get into the whole of the breath. And that's what you're focusing on. You couldn't really see anything else. So I was not aware of any mosquitoes biting me. You've gone inside. And that was a fantastic thing to be able to do. You did it because you had to, because otherwise, if your mind wandered, it wouldn't be wandering off into the past or the future, but wandering off mosquitoes, and it was just so irritating. So I thank the mosquitoes there for helping me with understand zooming in. And that was actually what you do in a breath meditation, you zoom in on it. 
And so everything else tends to vanish. And you see from the beginning, from the end of the breath. And see the gaps in between. And that's so similar to what I was explaining earlier about the walking meditation. You experience the whole of the, the movement of the foot, say just the left foot, as it lifts up, as it moves forward. And you soon find, and many people who are even like dancers understand this, you don't decide how the foot is going to move. You just do an ordinary breath. You just let it happen and watch it. It becomes just a, the foot moves by itself. Especially if you do a simple path you, from the beginning to the end, the end back again, and you keep on doing this. And after a while, the brain realizes it does not need to give instructions. It knows how to walk on this particular part. It becomes automatic. And it's just similar to the fact that when in the old days, when soldiers used to march from place to place, some of those soldiers could fall asleep and they would still be marching in line and they wouldn't sort of fall out of line simply because the body was doing it by itself while the poor tired soldiers were having a break. And this is the same with just how the body moves sometimes. I remember the first time that happened about in a long walk over in Thailand, it was you know, at a time when I was uh, on my wanderings, you know, after five years as a monk. And it's great to actually to be walking along the path and the, the legs were doing it. I wasn't giving any orders at all. I was very aware, very mindful, and the body was moving by itself after you know, a couple of hours, two or three hours of walking. I might have been able to, to actually to experience that. It was almost like a little insight, only a tiny insight into non-self. You didn't need to give orders. The body knew exactly what to do, and it just did it. So you can just uh, be aware and peaceful. But anyway, that's when we have the learn to experience the, the whole of the breath as you breathe in and out. It doesn't mean the body at all, not the physical body. You're zooming in so that physical body starts to vanish. Otherwise, you'll be always um, sensitive to the fifth sense of physical touch. You know, the, the pressure in your bottom, the heat in your bottom, the sounds, everything. So what we're trying to do is to calm all that down and keep it still so that disappears. Now, there's a little story about this, which uh, comes up well now, and how meditation works. And this was the story that when I did, <coughs> when I was a young meditator, still a lay person, and I spent one year at uh, the University of Durham, in the north of England, and there was not many places you can meditate there, but there was a place, I think it still exists, Throssell Hall. I remember going there in the early days, and it was a Zen uh, retreat. So because it was a Zen retreat, they did have the Zen master would actually walk behind you with a stick. But you know, he never hit me. And the only reason he never hit me because they hit the, the, the man sitting next to me first. And they said it doesn't hurt, it just wakes you up. But I didn't believe that at all. That really sounded painful. And as soon as that guy got hit, my back was straight for the rest of the retreat. But that wasn't the main thing I learned on that retreat. The greatest insight I got on that retreat was that they suggested that you meditate with your, <coughs> sorry, with your eyes open. When you're meditating with your eyes open, I've never done that before. As I was taught, you always close your eyes in order to lessen one sense, the sense of sight uh, disturbing you. But now I, I was always willing to try anything. And so I kept my eyes open, but at least I knew just how to stay in this moment and have some inner silence. I wasn't thinking. I wasn't going into some fantasies or dreaming or writing my autobiography or anything else which people do when they're supposed to be still and meditating. I was just uh, watching this with my eyes open, watching this whitewashed wall. It was an old barn they converted to the meditation room, the zendo, if they called it. And as I was watching this wall after about 20, 25 minutes, the wall vanished. That was a really fascinating experience. You're watching, like you're watching the screen now, and the whole thing, not just it turns off, the whole screen disappears, vanishes. And 
that was weird. But because that was the late 60s, I don't know, early 70s when that's happened, and you know, people were into taking hallucinogenic drugs. I never did. I was a good young man. That was actually fascinating. We weren't scared. So when that happened, I thought, wow, this is really interesting. Because you know, it's the first time I've ever seen a big wall of a barn just suddenly disappear. And these experiences, weird and strange experiences, is where you get insight from. I was enjoying it for a while, just having no wall to see with my eyes fully open. And then after a while, I realized that what was occurring was something not so sort of supernatural, but something which was quite easily explained by science, but quite rare for people to, exp to actually to, to know for themselves. And that was that even when you close your eyes, when you first close your eyes, you can see the inside of your eyelids. But after a while, because that's not interesting the brain, it's not an important thing to watch, the brain turns that off. It's like a switch goes off in your brain, nothing to watch, so the sense of sight stops for a little while. That's what was happening, but my eyes were fully open when the sense of sight just stopped. Nothing to watch. If I turned around or something moved, then I could, I could observe it. And it reminded me of what we call, you know, these days, an ambient noise. If you've got the same sort of noise, it can be even loud after a while, you can't hear it. It's why people can go to sleep in rooms next to a busy highway or next to a railway line. They can have a good night's sleep every evening because they're used to it. Saying it's used to it is not really quite the right word because the sound is just constant. It doesn't change, and so the brain doesn't recognize it. It turns off. Sometimes you have the sound of a fan or the sound of an air con if you're lucky. It's really hot today, 39 degrees this afternoon. That's over 100 Fahrenheit. But at least I know and it's always good to have like hot weather like this because it means that people will understand what hell realms are like and never want to do anything wrong and always make sure they look after Venerable Chanda because they want to go to a hot realm like that or even hotter afterwards. <laughs> and so little by little that you don't feel it anymore. If it, cha if it changes, you feel it. If it's constant, the sound of a fan, the sound of an air con, just disappears. It's just what the brain does and what the mind does as well. So this is how what I realized that that is okay to watch with your eyes open, like a boring white wall, because it doesn't change or move. It will disappear by itself after a while. That's one of your five senses. The sixth sense, the mind, is uh, something more profound but the first of those senses is turned off. Yeah, taste in the mouth. Same old saliva, that turns off. Sense of smell, turns off. The hardest ones to turn off is of course the, the sound. You don't need to be in a totally silent place. There's a background noise after a while, you can't hear it, turns off. The most difficult thing to turn off is your body sense. Sound is also difficult, but the body sense is also difficult to turn off, which is so many parts of the, the sense of feeling, of physical touch, sorry. And so that's one of the reasons why we focus on the breath. We zoom in on it, and then all the other feelings of the body, the fifth sense, the physical touch, that disappears, so you're only left with the breathing. Because you're only left with the breathing, after a while, that breathing gets so subtle, so peaceful, you don't need much oxygen because you're not doing anything. And that soon gets so soft and peaceful, that too disappears. That's why I often call the breath a stepping stone into the mind, the mind freed from the five hindrances. It just focus on one thing and then it just, you can't feel the rest of the body. It all disappears, which is a wonderful thing to be able to do. So anyway, this is one of the reasons why to see the whole of the breath, 
not the body. The body is just quite irritating. You don't have to be old or sick to know how irritating the body is. Sometimes I ask people when we're giving a talk or doing a meditation instructions to keep your eyes open, watch everybody else in the hall. And you see that there's always somebody just lift their hand up and scratch their head or they scratch them, they move this and they move that. And they're always moving. Just watch people so they're in an auditorium and they just cannot stay still. And the reason is because the body is irritating. It needs a scratch, it needs to burp, it needs to you know, just move the eyelids because otherwise the eyes get dry. It needs to <coughs> or sneeze or wiggle or do something. And sometimes because we got used to this, we don't notice notice how irritating this body is, but you watch someone meditating and they really are still. There's some time ago, you know, that the monk shouldn't have done this without permission. I, you know, I was responsible as well. But the former abbot of Bodhinyana Monastery, Ajahn Chakra, we decided, he was giving a talk, we decided to, you know, use the fast forward button to actually, to, to he was actually meditating, sorry, fast forward button and to actually to see how much his body moved when he was meditating. It was very inspiring to see it was still, he hardly moved at all. In normal vision, a normal speed, you get used to a little bit of movement here, a little bit of movement there. But you fast forward it and the slightest movements really stand out. And so this is one of the reasons why, that it's very hard for the body to be still. But, in meditation, because you're not watching the body, you're just watching inside the breath, then the rest of the body can become still very easily. I mean, really still. I often say, actually not just me saying, this was one of the Buddha's sayings, the most comfortable his body could ever feel was in meditation, even as an old monk, when he was just you know, very close to death, not to Parinibbana rather. This was the most comfortably felt when he could allow the body to become still and go deep inside. And this is one of the reasons why that it means the whole body of the breath, not the physical body. The purpose of meditation is to let go of the body, to go deeper inside. And as you get deeper inside and you have the awareness of the whole breath, the fourth stage here, then you learn to calm the breath as you breathe in and out. And learning to calm the breath is basically learning to restrain from disturbing it. It's not what you do. You try and make the breath calm and it disturbs the meditation. You can't do it. Now, this is an example I'm sure you've seen, but you can't really describe this uh, fully on a, a video but it's all similarly of the cup. It's got water in it. And I ask people, how can I get the water in the cup to be perfectly still? How can I calm the water in the cup? And I say, you're mindful of it. I can watch it, it's still moving. You can concentrate, but the water will never be still that way. The only way to get this water perfectly still is to put it down, to let it go, leave it alone, don't disturb it. It will become peaceful, still, all by itself. That's how you calm the water, you let it go. Renounce it, put it down, stop attaching to it. And then it becomes calm all by itself, always. Sometimes it takes a long time, a short time, but you learn how to leave it alone. However, sometimes, what happens is people, okay, I'm just going to leave my breath alone, not do anything. Is it calm yet or not yet? So is it calm yet or not yet? Is it calm yet? Not yet. You keep disturbing it every time you check it, check up on it. So we don't disturb anything. We put it down and we wait. We wait patiently, gently. And that is the fastest way for the breath to become so calm. And just like when the body relaxes, when the breath is very, very calm and smooth, it does become joyful. And this is the next part of Anapanasati, but this is not included 
in this part of the right mindfulness. It comes later on, and I'll come into this later on, when the mindfulness is just so joyful. You have Piti Sukha, sorry, with the breath, beautiful breath. Now, one of the monks, which uh, I still respect, he's still alive, and if any of you have a chance to visit him, please do so, Masaj and Ganha. He spent a range retreat at Bodhinyana Monastery a long time ago. Very fortunate to have him here. And he was, he's a cousin of Ajahn Chah. He trained at uh, Wat Bapon. But he was, uh, he was one who had incredible loving kindness. And for those of you who don't know this story, he was the one that it was confirmed. All the other monks saw this. He was meditating in the jungle, sitting on the ground with some other monks. It was the sound of an animal coming towards them. So they all opened their eyes. And it was a king cobra. And the king cobra, <laughs> these are really dangerous snakes. So it went right up to Ajahn Gunha, lifted up its head, opened its hood, and right in front, I don't know if I can do this on the, right in front of Ajahn Chas. <laughs> just to bite his nose or to bite him on his nose, never bit him. He was just chesting Ajahn Chah out. So not Ajahn Chah, sorry, Ajahn Ganha. And what Ajahn Ganha did, other monks saw this, was you know, incredible. He had so much loving kindness. He just, Ajahn Ganha lifted up his hand and he patted the King Cobra on the head. Now, what do you think happened next? Look, it's so rare for a, a snake like a king cobra to get his head patted that, of course, he didn't bite him. He just wanted more. I mean, how, how rare is that to get your head patted really softly by an amazing sort of monastic like an Ajahn Gunha? And so after, I don't know how long, five minutes or so, the snake put his head down and went to, to the second monk, raised his head, opened up its hood in front of the second monk. And according to how I was told, I wasn't there at the time, but the second monk said, no, I'm not doing that. If you want your head patted, go to watch a gun. Because it's a bit scary patting a snake on the head. But that's the sort of monk Ajahn Ganha was. And so there's many, many stories like that. But anyway, Ajahn Gunha, when he came over here, we asked him to teach meditation. And he taught meditation, but it was such a simple teaching. And his teaching of meditation, he did the same talk every time. When you breathe in, breathe in, so Breathe out. Sapa. Then what? So that's it. That's all you need to do. And there was something really brilliant in that. He never gave too many descriptions like I do. But what he did was just teach some of the essence of it. Make sure the breath is beautiful, delightful, soft, lovely. The word sabai, sorry, I should have explained, is a Thai word meaning just really nice and easy, cool, gentle, fantastic, wonderful, even sensuous, easy. Breathe in, sabah. Breathe out, sabah. It becomes so joyful. You can watch your breath forever, it seems. So little by little we learn the importance of that joy in the meditation. And that means you, you love meditating and you just you can't, get, can't get enough of it. And it's great for your health as well. So anyway, but when the breath starts to become peaceful, like that, of course it, it settles down by itself. It becomes very calm. You don't need much breath. That's some of the reasons why that sometimes when you're breathing, you get into deep meditation. Sometimes you, people think you're not even breathing. Sometimes you're not, but actually... Most of the time you are, but it's just a soft, easy breath. It's so peaceful. And that's where the, big, the difference between an in-breath and out-breath is so difficult to discern. It looks like the same. And that is where your awareness of the breath starts to vanish. 
because nothing is changing, things disappear. But that is part of the deeper teaching of meditation on the breath when we start to access the, the mind, the jitter. But anyway, with the right mindfulness, you learn to calm the breath as you breathe in and out. Just as a skilled painter is aware whether they are making a long brush stroke or a short brush stroke, so too when the in-breath is long, you're aware that it's long or short or in between or whatever. Now, for those of you who know your Satipatthana Sutta or Anapanasati Sutta, you know that is not the same simile as the Buddha said. I said a skilled painter is aware, aware, say aware that they're making a long brush stroke or a short brush stroke. Here they say a skilled a lathe worker. Now a lathe is, spins an object around and you have a little knife and you can carve that um, piece of wood or sometimes even piece of metal and make a beautiful shape. And not many people know that. In Thailand 47 years ago, we made one of those and I remember using that many times to be able to, uh, to make objects you know, such as uh, the shaft for your umbrella or other things which we made and made you uh, needed a lathe for. And it was all done just by foot, by uh, using a long bamboo pole. I won't describe it in detail, but because I used it, the Buddhist simile makes a lot of sense to me. But for many people, it makes no sense at all. A lathe, a long turn or a short turn. So I changed the simile to a, a stroke with a paintbrush, which all of you have done these days. This is one of the reasons why I used this, uh, the word of the Buddha, to change some of the similes to make them more powerful, easier to understand. So that's one example there. A skilled painter is aware whether they're making a long brush stroke or a short brush stroke. In this way, you're aware of your own body, or you're aware that the bodies of others are the same nature as yours, or you abide aware of the nature of both your own and others' bodies. That's the Ajata Bahida. Or else you abide aware that what causes the arising of the body, the four nutriments, and I'll say something about that in a moment, or abide aware the body will cease when the four nutriments cease. This is what people sometimes call a rise and fall. That is a really sort of, uh, uh, not a full description of what that word means, Udaya and Atagamana. It means that why they come into being, why they disappear, the cause is behind them. Once you're aware of what causes the rising of the body, the four nutriments, so you abide aware the body will cease when the four nutriments cease, or you abide contemplating the body's causal nature of both arising and ceasing. Of us mindfulness, it is just a body, impermanent, anicca, suffering dukkha, and not me, not mine, and not a permanent essence. It's established in you to the extent necessary for mindfulness and wisdom essential for liberation. And you abide independent, not clinging to anything in the world. This is one way that you are mindful of the body. Now, uh, if you go on to a little bit further, okay, this is on page 38. The arising and passing away, rise and fall, and the nutriments. Now, to make sure you understand, I'm not making this up. This is from the Samyutta Nikaya, the Satipatthana Samyutta, which actually explains some of these terms in a more a clearer way, rise and fall, what does that mean? So here, this is on page 38, arising and passing away, and the nutriments. Nutriments is like food, what, what keeps them going. I will teach you the arising and passing away, the samudhiya and atagamana of the four focuses of mindfulness, the satipatthana. Supported by the four nutriments, there is the arising and continuance of the body. With the cessation of the four nutriments, the body ceases. The four nutriments are food, six sense contacts, 
will and consciousness is. The consciousness is of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and knowing. And this is really important. It made so much sense to me. If you see someone who is in a coma, had a stroke and you think they're gone, if they don't get any sensory stimulation, they probably will pass away. So that's one of the reasons why it's good. If you, know, if you want them to continue on living, they're not really old, you don't want to let them go yet, that you, know, you stroke their hands, you talk to them, you stimulate their senses. Because without that stimulation, they're gonna go. And the other thing is things like will, wanting to live. I don't know how many times you've seen this, I've seen this very often, that a, a person uh, is, they should have been dying days ago, but then sort of somebody comes from overseas to see them and they come and you know, they say hello and then the person dies. It's as if they're keeping alive, you know, to keep alive for someone. They're using their will to stay alert and alive. So this is what it means by the rise and fall, the causes for a body. That might seem very obvious to you, but later on, when we get say to the third Satipatthana, the arise and passing away of the jitta of the mind. Even the jitta has its causes. And when those causes stop, so does the jitta, the mind. And that's very, very clear. This is why we do this contemplation or this practice of Satipatthana. To see that these things, as it said here, this is just a body, just experience, just chit or whatever, impermanent suffering, not me, not mine, not a self. It's not a permanent essence. It's established in you to the extent necessary for mindfulness and wisdom essential for liberation. It's not always going to be there. And you abide independent, not clinging to anything in the world. So that is the mindfulness of the body, stage one. A few more, but I've gone through some of the important parts. And later on, I will need to go through those important parts again and just say the different examples of this. So you, you get the message. If you get it this way, the message this way, then who? Maybe understand why people, some people actually do get in mind. Sadu, sadu, sadu. <laughs> Excellent. So I hope you enjoyed that. But now there is the letting go practice, the letting go room, the falling away of what's in your bladder or somewhere to go to the toilet and have a bit of a break for five minutes. And also now is the time to type in any questions. Awesome. Sending them please to Q&A Derek. <laughs> but you never thought your first name would be Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Very good. Oh, if I you want even just into... stretch. Go. Yeah, no. I hope I'm not going into too much detail. If you want it a bit uh, quicker or deeper or just stay with the, the words in the suttas or you just want me to carry on with some of these stories, please let me know. Personally, I think it's perfect, Ajahn. I think we can trust the Dhamma that comes out to be completely appropriate. Okay. <laughs> okay. You know, sometimes when I'm teaching in front of a live audience, you, know, you actually see their faces. And sometimes you see their faces go down or they start to fall asleep. <laughs> you know, that you've got to actually to liven up your talk with some more interesting examples. Yeah. Now, for those of you who haven't heard, that on one occasion, uh, there was a, a service over in Sydney in front of um, Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth of Australia. Because she's <laughs> Queen Elizabeth of Australia and also the Queen of... UK. And You're welcome to role. her, Ajahn. <laughs> no, I was amazed just as how uh, alert and mindful she was. And that's many people. She was in her 80s at this time. And she's 90s now. And it's amazing just 
as a human being, just how she performs that role and does it such well, so well. But anyway, what I did notice, because it was in the Sydney Cathedral, she was sitting in the front, front row, but also I was where the choir was because we were going to say a few things about Buddhism afterwards. And she had this big hat on. You notice in formal occasions, she had this hat with a long rim on the outside. And I often wonder why that's, what that's for. It's not to protect her from the sun because she usually travels you know, in some vehicles. She's not really out there walking. And I realized what it was for because I was watching her, you know, as you do. And then during the service, it was actually during the, the archbishop's speech, which was boring, I must admit. And her head went down. She was falling asleep. I could see that because I was only sitting a couple of meters away from her. Her head went down, I was facing her, and her head went down. You can understand as soon as she went to a certain angle, you couldn't see her eyes anymore. And that gave her the opportunity to close them and take a nap. And I reckon that's, you know, the TV cameras can't see that. Because of the position of where I was, I was pretty sure that that was her just taking a bit of a snooze. She must have been jet lagged and a boring speech, you know, in a hot place. Of course, you get sloth and torpor. So I made, that's actually what I learned about why. <laughs> I'm actually the Queen Elizabeth, whatever, she wears big hats in churches when there's boring sermons. Well, maybe that's one reason that the Buddha told monastics to shave their heads, Ajahn, so that we can be visible ah. at all times. Yeah, we know when we're falling asleep. Anyway, I thought okay. just a little anecdote. Yeah. yeah. So, only one Good question questions. so far, but I'm sure more will come. Oh no, Derek says okay. more. Okay, so we'll get a lot of questions probably. So someone's asking, why does heat build up in the body during breath meditation? Does it disappear at some point? <laughs> it does disappear. But first of all, some of that heat builds up at the very beginning. It's so similar to, you know, you drive your car to a meeting and then of course you turn the car off, but it's hot. It takes a while for the heat to dissipate out of the engine until it becomes a cool again. And I remember just, so sometimes people say, oh my goodness, have I turned the engine off? It's gone cool. And no, no, no. It's just, you know, it's still, so have I turned the engine off? It's hot. It takes a while to cool down. The same as your body takes a while to cool down. Because your metabolism, when you start meditating, is adjusted to doing things, you know, to, to turning on your computer, moving this, moving that, to thinking. And as you really calm down, again, the metabolism takes a little bit longer. It's a little out of step with your mind. It takes a while to stop sort of uh, the heart beating so fast. It's never beating fast, but it's beating a little bit too fast and it's needed. And so that creates the extra energy in your body, which has to go somewhere. Now, that's the first thing. It's just at the beginning of meditation. But if the, the heat starts to come up later on in meditation, then that's usually a good thing because, please excuse me for spending a bit of time on this, but it's really important because sometimes you get hot spots in the body. In other words, heat not all over the body, but just in part of the body. And that is fantastic because what that means is you're healing yourself. <laughs> so many times this has happened, especially during retreats. Somebody said, my shoulders were really hot. Not unpleasant, it was nice, but the rest of the body was cool, but my shoulders were really, really warm, pleasantly warm. And then the usual answer to that is, you know, when did you have your car accident? When did you have your whiplash? When did you sort of injure yourself? And when you say things like that, people's reactions are really interesting. Saying, I knew it, Ajahn Brahm, you had psychic powers. You read my mind. Yes, I never told you I had a big car accident a year ago. And now you know it. So it's not psychic powers. It's just cause and effect. You know that that's one of the reasons why when you let go, you leave your body alone, it actually sends energy to the correct places. And you get hot spots in your body, like in your back. It's so common. 
or women in their breasts. You know, they're curing a, a, an incipient breast cancer or something. Your body is incredibly powerful and it can send energy to so many places to heal it. And you usually experience it as heat in the body. So if that's happens, heat in part of the body, wonderful. If it's in the whole of the body, that might be, find out is it just in the skin or is it inside? Because this can be some amazing sort of healing energy coming up, your own healing energy, not coming from any supernatural place. It comes from inside of you, which you usually block out of fear or you're just too busy, the poor body doesn't have a chance. And I say that as a physicist, and you've seen it many, many times and experience it in your own body as well. It's wonderful. It's just one part, it's really beautifully warm. Well done. Something really good is happening. Okay. Okay. So lots of questions. Um, okay. On retreats, when I get really, really calm, I sometimes develop a sense of cooling down and a lack of interest in lay stuff. And that creates a lot of fear in me of losing good relationships that I created in life. How to keep practicing and not be afraid of becoming a monk? <laughs> afraid of becoming a monk is a wonderful thing to become a monk. <laughs> but not afraid, be excited, you're going to become a monk. Wow, this is great. But sometimes people think, oh, I just, but I've got sort of. This actually happened years ago. There was this one, there's a Sri Lankan gentleman who was. Uh, starting off he thought he discovered a new type of meditation and he was telling people oh, now you're a stream winner now you're a once return and now you're a non-return and now you're an our hut he was actually telling people and people were believing this and so i remember this as one one man so <laughs> like man went there and he was doing really really well and he rang up his wife who's still back in perth and this was happening in sri lanka and he rang his wife saying oh the teacher has just told me I'm a stream winner. Oh, congratulations, well done. And a week or two later, uh, he just told me I'm an, a once returner. Oh, that's so inspiring. And then the wife said, um, please come home now. I don't want you to be a non-returner because if you're a non-returner, you won't want to go to work anymore and we still have a mortgage to pay off. <laughs> come back on the next flight. <laughs> because she was afraid that being a non-returner, you don't really get involved. You know, this is an anagami. You don't get involved in worldly things. So he wouldn't even go to work and worry about money. And so the poor man would never be able to pay off the mortgage in the house. It turned out to be just false in the end. This man was, he thought he was doing the right thing, but it's obvious that he wasn't. Uh, the, this is the monk. And anyway, uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, that um, little by little, as we meditate more and more, we don't do it to get things. We learn it to let go of things, to be more free, to be more peaceful. So you find if you really, really, really get very deep in meditation, you're not so attached to so many other things in life. Still, you carry on being a lay person or a lay uh, and they, if you've got um, responsibilities, you've got kids or something, you've got to look after them. And a, a lot of times this happens that people come up to me and say, no, I don't want to live the lay life anymore. I want to become a monk. It's one of the things which I ask them, have you got young children? Are they going to be well looked after? And if they say no, I say, no, you can't become a monk. I don't care how sort of faithful you are, look after your kids first of all, be a responsible person. If you're being irresponsible, then how on earth are you going to become a monk? What type of wisdom have you got? What kindness have you got? You have to have your permission of your family. And I really take that seriously. And I've said no to quite a few people, usually that it was a good decision I made because they weren't really ready. They thought they were very deep, but it was just an escape. It wasn't really going towards happiness, it was escaping from responsibility and trouble. So little by little, if you do get deep in meditation, it's always, always, always positive. You don't have to become a monk. A lot of times people get that deep meditation, get deep insights. They live their life as a monk, 
So to say, they live the life as a lay man or lay woman. They do their duties. And when it comes a time when their duties are fulfilled, they work towards fulfilling their duties. And their relationship actually develops even greater. Even like the Buddha, his relationship to his wife and son after he became the Buddha was so much more powerful as an enlightened being. They became monks and nuns and they became enlightened too. A wonderful thing you can give to the people you care about. So basically, nothing to worry about. Okay. Ajahn, we're getting an extraordinary amount of wonderful questions. So, okay, I'll be faster. Um, I'm not sure how we're going to... We'll try our best. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, how to develop delightfulness when sadness wants to stay in the heart? And what advice would you give to someone with depression? Yeah. To say with depression, look on the other side of life. Two bad bricks in the wall. I knew what it's like. Just the, you made a mistake. You got depressed about that. You felt guilty about that. You couldn't let it go because all you could see is the two bad bricks. You're depressed. You have sadness. How about looking at it in a different way? When my father died, I was only 16. Instead of crying, I thought I had 16 years with that fellow and I really um, was impressed by those years. It wasn't long enough, but I loved it. And so I saw the beauty of, you know, that it didn't last long, but it was wonderful. So amazing, I wasn't sad at my father's death. I never cried. So sadness, is that looking at life and seeing its faults. And whatever happens to you in life, you can always see its positive side. So the sadness is actually overcome by wisdom, by kindness. And that means that you have a truckload of dung in front of your front door. Great, more fertilizer for my garden. It's there, you can't get someone to take it away, but instead, you don't blame anybody, you make use of it. There's nothing in this life which you can't make use of. That's what I've seen. Might be sad. Even depression, make use of it. I told this one guy years ago, I think I might have mentioned this before, that, you know, I said, what do you have for breakfast? Oh, what do you have for breakfast this morning? He said, I had ice cream for breakfast. Ice cream for breakfast? I said, yeah, because now I'm depressed. They let me have whatever I want to eat. Exactly. You see the benefits in being depressed? So I whispered in his ear, said, look, when you get out of the depression, please don't tell anybody. Don't tell your wife. Don't tell your family. So you can have ice cream anytime you like. He laughed. It made him see his depression as something positive. Thank you, Ajahn. Go on. What is the best way to meditate for someone who has ADHD? You don't have ADHD all the time. When you get labels like that, people adopt those labels and they live up to those labels. There are times when you have ADHD, and there are times when you don't. So you can meditate the times you don't have ADHD. And you'll find challenge those descriptions. But it's an old story, I'll tell it very quickly, about a great experiment which was done in the English education system. Two classes of children gave them an exam at the end of the year, they split them up evenly. So equal abilities for the next year. Same teachers, same uh, good classrooms. The only thing they, they, they did was uh, stigmatize them, if you like, they didn't know this, they were equal. They called one class A and another one class B. That's all they did. And after one year, they gave them the end of the year exam. And the children who were in class A, they were the same as the other children from the last year's exam. They did so much better than the children in class B. Because you called the kids class B kids for 12 months, and the parents thought they were class B kids. The teachers thought they were class B kids. The only people who were into this, uh, who knew about what was going on in this experiment, was the headmaster and two educational psychologists. They became class B kids because they believed the experts. 
they became ADHD because you believe the experts prove them wrong meditate don't believe don't be stigmatized don't be imprisoned by what other people tell you never allow your learning to stand in the way of truth Next one? Yeah. Okay. Whichever technique I try, it happens that at a certain point, I start hearing some voices in my head and they talk random stuff. And then they talk to the point where I realized that I fell asleep for a few seconds and was dreaming. How can I avoid falling asleep? Sleep more at night. First of all, just check your sleep habits. A lot of people are sleep deprived. They come to a retreat, they haven't slept enough. They're working and just, they have a family and they have worries and troubles and they just, their poor old brain is just tired out. So if your brain wants to fall asleep, please let it. Be kind to your brain, say, dear old brain, if you want to take a nap for a few moments, that's fine by me. Then that kindness, that gentleness takes away the stress which means that you don't need to sleep so much. So just find out why you're sleepy. It is because you try not to be sleepy. There's an old story, of, I have chatted her this many times, she's seen it herself. Oh, in the meditation retreats, the residential ones, you see people meditating in the afternoon or evening and they've got their head down, they're falling asleep. And they find it so easy to sleep during the meditation. Then at the evening, we ring the bell, okay, everyone can go to their, their rooms now and have a sleep. And they complain they can't fall asleep when they're in their room. <laughs> but I tell them it's obvious. When you go to your bed at the end of the day, so lay down in your bed and try to meditate. Then you'll fall asleep. <laughs> when you're in the hall, listen to one of my talks. See if you can pretend to go to bed and fall asleep, then you'll be wide awake. <laughs> there's a lot of truth in that. The reason why there's a lot of truth in that is because people try too hard. When they need to fall asleep, they try to fall asleep instead of relaxing. When they're meditating, they try to meditate instead of just being here. We try far too hard and that tires us out so much. Okay. So my cousin has been in a coma for almost two months. A couple oh. of weeks he, ago, he opened his eyes, but he's not responding to any stimuli and he's on his own most of the time. What is happening to his consciousness at this time and what can we do? Is Meta a good way to help? Meta is a great way to help, but also please know that when he's not responding, when a person opens their eyes the first time, often is the case that they... They're hearing you, they're seeing you, but they don't know actually how to respond. This is a true story. One of these <laughs> women I remember meeting over in, in uh, Singapore years ago, that she'd been in a coma and the doctors said, oh no, she's, she's going to go, she's dying. And they asked permission from the, the family, you know, by the bedside, can we turn the machines off? the life support, and the family, because it was Chinese family, they said it's the elder brother's responsibility, the eldest son, you have to make that decision. He said, no, it's too big a decision to decide whether my mother should live or not. But he said, well, it's your decision. But what was actually happening, that the mother was in a coma, but she could hear everything. She could see. She could feel, but she couldn't talk or move her, her digits of her fingers or anything. So no, she obviously recovered, that's why I can tell this story. That and she said she was thinking and willing, son, son, I'm still here. Don't turn off the machine, please. And she felt very scared because she all she could do was think. She couldn't speak, she couldn't move her body. And then the son said, Okay, give her another day. I just, oh, thank you, son. She thought, 
and the next 24 hours she could move her hand a tiny bit, which meant that they realized that you know, she was actually not passed away. She was actually recovering, but very slowly. It took her a year or two to get her, her speech back and her walking back. But, you know, she became a, uh, one of the nice talk show hosts, talk show um, stars. When we ever gave talks in Singapore, we'd always bring her up and tell her, what was it like in the coma? What happened? So well, I could hear and I could feel, but I couldn't respond. And I knew what was going on, but I, I couldn't say anything. So if that uh, person had started opening their eyes, looked them in their eyes and say, well, you know, you, you, know, you may still be here. So you know, just keep on going. This is what's happening with the family. Tell them this is what's happening with the, the weather or anything else that really interested me. <laughs> Depends on what, <laughs> what nationality they are. <laughs> I used to do what I used to find a telephone call to ring up my mother when she was alive. I was calling from Thailand. It took a long time to arrange a call. And, How are you, mum? Oh, I'm fine. What's the weather like? <laughs> just the same old conversations you always have. It was funny. Just, But anyway, the nice thing was we were talking with them. Ordinary stuff. And so you hold their hand and just massage their hands and massage their feet. Stimulate them whichever way you can. You don't lose anything by stimulating their, their organs, and sometimes they come further out of the coma. Okay, but if she can't go and see them, then Meta can work as well. Meta can, oh, have Meta can work, yeah. yeah. We'll just get anybody who, who can go and see them, just tell yeah. them to talk to them. Even actually doing that much, talking to them on the phone, on a video, and put it right in front of their eyes. And sometimes say, I know you probably can see me. You probably can see me, mum. So then this is what's happening over here in, in UK or wherever else you are in the world. And I hope you're okay. Hope to see you soon. Bye, mum. Talk to them as if they were there. Great. Thank you, Ajahn. When the body is moving during meditation, should this be responded to in some way or ignored? Depends how it's moving. If you're levitating, great, that's really impressive. <laughs> no, I'm only joking there. It's, uh, if it is moving, depends on actually what moving it is. If it's moving by itself, in other words, you didn't do it, it's just you're twisting around or the head is moving down or it's moving left and right, it's much better just to leave it alone. Often the time is the body knows what to do and we interfere with it. And after a while, it just disappears by itself. I trust my body. So if the body wants to move, it can do. And I, I don't do, I don't interfere, I don't initiate it, I let it happen by itself. And that's wonderful to see. Often, sloth and talk, my head was down the bottom there, and I tried to fight it, be more mindful or whatever. But what really worked was just doing nothing, just watching. And after a while, the body moved by itself, it straightened out by itself. That was really good. I trusted my body, the body knew what to do. And I let it do it, I didn't get involved. All right, please can you explain the difference between will and will power and why one is favorable as one of the four nutrients and why the one is less favorable in some contexts? They're all not really favorable. I prefer wisdom power. It's always more effective than willpower. Uh, so in a four nutriments, you know, the will, that is to just to, um, that is important to keep the, uh, the body actually going. You know, and if you take away that will, then the body just uh, has, it's not that uh, stable. You know, that's what the body is here for, for the will to play with. It's one way of looking at it. And if you just let go of your will, then a lot of times the body vanishes. Just like the Buddha, you gave up the will to live. Under the Chapa shrine in Vaisali, said, all my jobs have been done. So, pass away in three months. Now that's a fantastic thing to be able to notice there. 
didn't sort of die because of the last meal. That was only, you could very easily get rid of that sickness if you wanted to. Died because done his job. Let go of the will to live. That's an important thing to keep this body going. You've seen sometimes people, and it's fascinating to see this, uh, the partner in life passes away and they pass away within days simply because they lost the will to live. So the other will, the other will to do something useful in life is important, but in meditation, both of those things are not important. All types of will just disturbs. And it's nice to know what it's like when the will stops, and disappears and vanishes. Then you understand what the will truly is. It's like a prison guard never lets you stand still, never lets you have any peace, always disturbing you. It would be wonderful to stop that. Well, why is it hard just to say, watch the breath with no will, let it happen naturally? Why is that so difficult? Because the will doesn't belong to you and it's a disturbing thing. Okay. When using the expression, letting go, Aren't we cultivating a aversion towards what we want to let go of? For example, let go of pain. Should we not rather say, let be? Now, what you let go of, you let go of controlling. And that controlling is wanting and aversion. And when you let go of that part of you, like you're letting go of your will, then what's left is very peaceful. So what's left is what we let be. And then, what disturbs things we let go of. It's different things we're letting go of. We're letting go of craving, of aversion, of wanting. We're not letting that be. We're letting go of that type of reaction which causes more busyness for us. When we do let those things go, then what's left is we let that be. It becomes so peaceful. It doesn't actually stay stable, it starts to disappear. So you actually start to go into the, the lotus, see what's in its centre. Okay, for a while now I'm experiencing some apathy. I think it's due to a major disappointment in my life, which is infertility. This affects my meditation. Could you give any advice about living and practicing with my current apathy? I, after a while, the, the apathy is painful. It's like a disease. Instead of being apathetic, one looks at some of the beauty in life. And, okay, you're infertile. What's wrong with that? Now, I'm infertile. Not because of something wrong with me physically, because I've become a monk. I have a wonderful time just you know, enjoying just not being able to carry on my species and my line. Well, you know, it's very help helpful if anyone ever thinks of becoming a monk or a nun. I had a, a brother and you know, he had children. Oh, and that got me out of a lot of stress because otherwise my mother and father, would, no, my father was dead by this time. They would want me to have children. They wouldn't let me become a monk. But because my, my brother was doing that part of the family business, you know, giving heirs and grandchildren to my mum, I was free. I got a lot of respect for him, but actually getting me out of a, a difficult situation. But you now being infertile, what's wrong with that? It's one of the reasons why that people feel when there's slightly something different to them, they call it there's something wrong with me. You know, any sickness you have, there's nothing wrong with being sick. It's just nature's way of actually healing you. So that's one of the reasons why I don't think there's anybody in this retreat who's never been sick in their life. If you hadn't been sick in your life, I'm 70 years old now. If I'd never had any sickness in my life, I'd be a medical um, weirdo. And they'd get me into some sort of hospital, even though nothing wrong with me, because I've never been sick in my life. They do all sorts of experiments on me. How come you've never been sick? So there's nothing wrong with being sick. 
It's actually wrong with being healthy all the time. In other words, sickness is part of life. So I tell many of my followers, when you go to see your doctor, when you say, oh, doctor, there's something wrong with me again. Never say that. Tell your doctor, doctor, there's something right with me. My COVID has come back. Doctor, there's something right with me. I've got migraine. Don't give sickness a bad name. Like sometimes we give the discriminated people in this world, whether they're refugees or whether they're LGBTQIA+, we give them a bad name. There's nothing wrong with this. It's part of life. We accept it, learn from it, make use of it, be kind to it. That's the way to live with things in a wise way. Being infertile, nothing wrong with that at all. Nothing wrong with being gay. Nothing wrong with having sickness. Because you have sickness, but you're much bigger than that. You see what's you know, underneath all of that. All those times I just mentioned, I've been in prisons looking after some of these prisoners. I've never seen a criminal in my life. I've never seen a murderer, a rapist, a, a thief. I've seen people who've done those things. But they're not... They're not thieves, not murderers. They're much bigger than that. They're more than that. Why should sort of, you know, two killings define a person's life? Why should being infertile define you? You're far bigger than that. You're more than that. So that's one of the reasons why we don't focus on two bad bricks in all. Two 998 amazing bricks. And we never feel that these things stigmatize us. Okay, there's loads of really good questions. Shall I keep going? Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, please do, yeah. Okay. Um, you told us about eating as a simile for meditation. Can you take it a bit further? Perhaps the main course on the menu is freedom. What is freedom? I've heard about it, sampled it at times, but haven't really had it myself. What would you say about it to whet one's appetite? There's two types of freedoms. The freedom of desire and the freedom from desire. And people mistake the difference between the two. Freedom of desire is you've got enough power, enough uh, resources, enough influence, you can get what you want whenever you want it. That's the freedom of desire. You find that freedom just never satisfy you. Always you want something else, and there's something else, and something else. All the rich and powerful people in the world, are they happy? Freedom from desire is what we do in meditation. You don't want anything in the whole world. We're at peace from desires. And that freedom from desire is the real freedom. Over in the United States, we call it the the, the leader of the free world. If you've ever been to the United States, it doesn't feel free. You go to a monastery, we've got all lots and lots of rules. I never felt so free in my life. I'm protected from desires, from wanting. It's a freedom from craving, from dunha, from wanting. That's a real freedom. Nothing you want. Okay. Very good. Um, I have tinnitus. It doesn't bother me. Once in a retreat, it went away. How can I find that state again where I don't hear the tinnitus? Ah, that's great when it went away. That's happened many, many times. But if you want it to go away, you expect it to go away, it will never go away. It's as the wanting which disturbs the mind and stops it doing whatever it needs to do to heal up. <coughs> So this is actually where it's okay to notice the door of my heart is open to you. Like the anger eating monster, tonight is a very hard thing to enjoy, but just love it. Be kind to it. Okay, tonight is you want to be, you can be. And after a while, we'll get less and less and less and less and less. Don't disturb the tinnitus. Uh, 
Venerable Chanda mentioned yesterday that she only met a handful of people who were enlightened, even at the first stage. Is it so difficult then? No, it's not difficult. But the people who are enlightened will never tell you, simply because there's no pride left. You're disappearing, you're, you're vanishing. And so there's nothing to hang a medal on. There's no wall for you to put a certificate on. So there's many, many great enlightened people in this world who you will never see. You actually see them, sorry, but you won't notice them. That's a nice thing to say. I always am very, very doubtful that people will go, say, on the internet and say they're enlightened, or say they're this or say they're that. And it's just, what are they doing that for? It's just you know, in order to get some more members, in order to justify their existence. The real enlightened people, they disappear. They vanish. There's no sense of self left. So they don't go shouting it out abroad. Enlightenment is freedom from desire. Not having a sort of a new personality, a new authority from which to shout out that you're better than other beings. This is something which the, one of my favorite suttas from the Buddha, when he was uh, with Ananda, that was his uh, main attendant for the last 25 years of his life. And then this, this one of the monastics came up to the Buddha and said, one who's enlightened, they never think they're better, they're worse, or the same as anybody else. He would say, yes, that's correct. And then another uh, monastic came up and said the same. One who's fully enlightened and arahat never thinks they're better, worse, or the same as anybody else. The Buddha said, correct. And then the Buddha turned around to Ananda and said, those were two uh, monastics who'd just become enlightened. That's how they tell me they're enlightened. They don't say, I'm enlightened. I'm really great. I'm wonderful. Let me teach. They never say that. They say that one who's enlightened never thinks they're better than other beings, never thinks they're worse, never thinks they're the same. That judgment of a sense of self, that measuring, is gone. That's something with the idea of like a mind. A mind, the, the idea of the party word for mind, one of the party words is mano. And what the mind does, what that, if a mano, what it does in Pali grammar is it measures. So when you don't measure, that means that the mind starts to stop and disappear. You're always measuring stuff, comparing stuff. That keeps the sense of self going. So it's nice to understand what that, the word actually mind really means. It's a measurer. Anyway, so when you don't measure anymore, the mind's gone. Next question. What do you think about being a tiny bit more firm with the breath, like deciding to notice it deep down in the belly? I'm a heavy thinker and might that help? Today, when meditating, yeah. I invited the breath to come when it wants, but then it stays quite high up in the body. Give it a try, experiment. That's one nice thing to do. Use your mindfulness and see what works for you. I'm just scrolling through because there's still a lot of questions. I'm trying to find the ones which are more oh, practice directed. Um, okay. Is there a way to distinguish between the brain and the mind in meditation or immediately afterwards, please? Yeah, the brain is just the tool of the mind. And the mind is much more peaceful. And next, uh, some of the examples which we have uh, in the next uh, few sutta classes, you'll see that much of the happiness which comes from watching the breath comes from the mind. It doesn't come from the body. It's ridiculous to think the mind can think that the breath is interesting. And if you haven't heard this simile, I'll do it at greater length later on. But just going to the toilet and doing a number two and seeing you know, a piece of my shit in the toilet bowl after a decent meditation, that looked one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life. This is no exaggeration. I'm not a crazy person. 
to see that and just go, wow, wow, this is incredible. That's a real experience. And that was the mind was adding so much. You can see the beauty in anything, even in a piece of my feces. So that starts to teach you something about the nature of beauty and the nature of happiness. That actually comes mostly from the mind, not from the brain. The brain sort of is trained by others, but the mind is independent. Okay, next question. In meditation, we're told to just allow the mind to calm down. Can you explain how this works with present moment awareness? The mind calms down because nothing is disturbing it. How does the tree, how does the leaves on the tree stop moving? Because there's no wind. It, it calm down by itself. Give it a try. You try and hold it, you soon get tired and exhausted. You let it be, you don't do anything. You stop blowing on stuff, nothing moves. It's the nature, it's the default. Simple thing, you got your computer screen on. If you stop clicking the mouse, you stop touching anything, your computer screen is just gonna to go to the screensaver and then the screensaver is gonna turn off. It's only in nature is to respond to movement. And so even just the mind stops when you stop moving it. So you get out of the way, leave it alone. It comes still all by itself, that's its very nature. Next question. Okay. If there's no self and everything is cause and effect and karma, et cetera, what is the will and who is in control of the will, please? <laughs> the will is cause and effect, it's caused by others. It's caused by what you watch, what you see, how you've grown up. And after a while you see just how much this will is not coming from you, it's caused by others. One of the reasons why people can hypnotize you and make you do all sorts of weird stuff and you think you've chosen to do that. While you go into shopping centers and you buy stuff, and you think you chose you know, what uh, food to buy or what clothes to wear, you haven't. That's been conditioned into you. So much of our life, we don't realize just how much we are controlled by politicians, by powerful people or powerful companies or by powerful families. And after a while, that scares you. You think you have free will, ha, ha, ha. And after a while in meditation, you notice, you start to find out what will truly is. You find out just how much of it you think it's yours. It's not, it's cause and effect. And quite frankly, by listening to talks like this, you may be a bit scared of what I'm saying, but after a while you get conditioned to let go and be free. So the world can vanish for a while. That's what jhanas are all about. The body vanishing and the, the world vanishing, the totally vanishing in the second jhana. So peaceful, so beautiful. And from the insight you get from that, is you understand what this world is. No longer will you cherish it as something of value. Why do you do and say the things you do? After a while, you realize it's just our conditioning, cause and effect. I was just saying earlier that I speak like this because I've been in Australia for many years. But when I was um, residing in Cambridge University, I spoke much better English, and I always managed to do a very jolly good show with whatever I did, simply because my conditioning was totally different. <laughs> Which one is a right and a wrong? Either of them. So little by, little by little, we just, it's shocking, it's scary to understand just how much of our will is conditioned by others. 100%. 100%. So who conditioned my will? Ajahn Chah. Why do I tell bad jokes? Because my father did. That's what I will do. <laughs> what was that silly joke about uh, uh, COVID? Uh, uh. Can I tell it? Uh, go on, then, yeah. Okay. Why don't ants get COVID? 
why don't ants get COVID? Because they've got little antibodies. <laughs> That's a stupid joke. That's nice. Why do I, what I tell those jokes for is because my dad used to tell jokes like that. <laughs> <laughs> why do I meditate? It's because I enchanted. Condition me. Thank you so much, Ajahn Chah, for good brainwashing me this way. Okay, one last question is from an 11 year old Ajahn who's um, snuck in to the question box. Oh, through yeah, many. Well done. <laughs> yeah, oh, excellent. <laughs> so he wants to know uh, if the Buddha Gautama is fully enlightened and full of wisdom, why was he hesitant to teach after his enlightenment? Why did it require Brahma Sahampati to come and request for the Buddha to teach? That's a brilliant question. Because he was so still, he needed someone to condition him. The world had been totally stilled. Sapasankara Samatha. When the world is totally still, just so quiet, it just needs someone to suggest, please teach for the benefits of so many human beings. And that was, Sahampati was an old friend of his from a previous life. Our Buddha and Sahampati were both monks under Kasapa. That's how the Sutta says. And when they were monks together, Sahampati came and saw the Buddha and said, congratulations, we were friends together in a previous life. I was born as a, a, a heavenly being in the Sudawasa, the pure abodes, which was where Anagamis get reborn. And I just come to say thank you, but also please teach the benefits of others. And if Sahabadi hadn't done that, and actually conditioned the Buddha to teach, the Buddha would be in another what we call Pacheka Buddhas, silent Buddhas, peaceful, full, enlightened, but never having just a little trigger to teach others. The great question. But now sometimes people say, well, Brahma Sahampati, they call him Bra Brahma Sahampati. Brahma means a type of God. And so I remember this one monk said, oh, yeah, that's really true. If Brahma Sahampati hadn't suggested for the Buddha to teach, there would be no Buddhism. So thank God for Buddhism. That's a joke. Oh. <laughs> God, Sa God Sahampati. Thank him for <laughs> otherwise be no Buddhism. <laughs> Okay, that's quite good. That's fair enough because then the Buddha yeah, taught the gods as well. So it's yeah, yeah. reciprocal. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Okay, thank you so much, Ajahn. And, okay. Uh, yeah, we'll see you Hope tomorrow. You it, uh, quite likely. Yeah. <laughs> Please take uh, care. Have a good bye, rest. Yeah. yeah, I will do. Yes. Yeah, enjoy cool. your afternoon, everybody. Keep warm, yeah. I would say, over here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, all the best to you. See ya. Bye. Bye, bye, bye.